Psalm 8. For the choir director, on the Gitteth, a psalm of David. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries, in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe the work of your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have put in place, what is a human being that you remember him, the son of man that you look after him? You made him a little less than God and crowned him with glory and honour. You made him the ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and the oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name in all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had the chance to meet someone famous or important? What did you do to be able to meet them? Did you have to be vetted? Did you win a competition? Were they so important that you had to be given a crash course in etiquette before you met them? And how much of an impression do you think you would have to make for that person to actually remember your name the next time you got to see them? Well, if it's this difficult to meet important people, what do we have to go through to meet with God, the creator of the universe? And this is the question at the heart of today's psalm. David reflects on how amazing God is and how small we are compared to the rest of creation. And he wonders, how can insignificant people like us ever hope to praise the God who created the universe? And if we did, why would he listen to us? But As we read this psalm, our God is not a God who is too proud to accept the praise of his people. And in fact, The psalm points us to exactly how far God is willing to lower himself in order to raise his people up to be with him so he can hear them sing. As we start to examine this psalm, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and we thank you for the word that you have given to us. And we pray that you will give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and the will to put into action what you have what you have to say to us today. Amen. David starts this psalm with an exclamation of praise. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name. When David speaks about God's name being magnificent, he means the reputation of God, his renown. But it's also a little bit more than that because your name represents you and who you are. So if your name is great, then you yourself are great. So David is starting by saying, look how great God is. And what's the thing that prompts David to reflect on the greatness of God? Well, it's the amazing nature of God's creation. He looks at the beauty of the world around him and says, wow, isn't the God who made this wonderful? When you look at a beautiful work of art and you say, wow, what a great piece of art, what you're also saying is, isn't the person who made this really good and talented to be able to make something so good? And that means when we look at the world around us and we say, wow, how beautiful is the world, what we're also saying is, wow, how amazing is the God who created this? And if creation is amazing and beautiful, then surely the one who made it is even more so amazing and beautiful. You see, this is why the first two of the Ten Commandments directly forbid idolatry and the worshipping of creation. How would you feel if you made something and then everyone you showed it to 
acted like you had nothing to do with its creation. That would be pretty hurtful. Well, yes, the creation that God has made is good and wonderful. But he, as the creator, is more good and more wonderful. And he is the one who deserves our praise much more than the creation. But then, as David reflects on the amazing nature of the world and the even more amazing nature of God, he has a sudden realization. Why would the creator of the universe be interested in him? He reflects on his own position towards God and thinks, why would a God who is amazing enough to create the universe want to hear from little old insignificant me? Well, just like meeting an important person in the world requires a level of pomp and ceremony, surely saying anything to the God who created the universe requires a high level of etiquette and vetting and pomp and ceremony. I mean, just think about it. When the President of the United States tours to another country, there's a whole lot of rules and procedures that must be followed. He has to have the right number of escorts. Anyone who meets him needs to be thoroughly vetted, given a crash course in etiquette, and even then only two or three people will be allowed to meet him. And I remember when Barack Obama came and visited Brisbane a number of years ago. His presidential limo caused problems because it was so big it didn't actually fit through some of the roundabouts in the Brisbane streets. And this caused a problem. They needed to work out exactly how they could get the president around the streets to all his important meetings. And if it's this hard to meet the president, who really is just a person, I mean, he's a very important person, don't get me wrong, but he's still just a person. How difficult for us must it be then to meet the God who created the universe? God surely has the right to demand nothing but the best, that we approach him with choirs and orchestras and marching bands. But David says something very different in verse 2. Have a look with me. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. You see... When God is faced with challenges to his greatness, when people say, surely you're not that great, God doesn't point to his heavenly choirs singing his praises. He doesn't point to the infinitude of the universe. He points to infants and babies and says, these guys understand who I am. They understand my greatness. That is how you know I am great. This is what Jesus was saying to the Pharisees when they confront him in the temple during our first reading from Matthew. Jesus has entered the temple. He's kicked out the people who are doing too much buying and selling and not enough praying. And he started healing people. And as he does, the children are singing. The Pharisees come up and say, Do you hear these kids? Why don't you stop them? And Jesus rebukes them. The priests were the ones who were supposed to know who Jesus was. They had read the Old Testament. They knew the promises of God. They were supposed to see that God was working through Jesus to bring people back to him. And except they forgot. And so Jesus points them to the children and says, These kids understand who I really am. Why don't you get it? That's because God is not too proud to accept the praises of even the lowliest of people. When the religious, the powerful, the wise and the learned forget who Jesus is, God sends the weak, the humble and the lowly to put them to shame because he is willing to accept praise from all of his children, no matter who they are or what situation they may be in. That's when Jesus sung this psalm, but Jesus takes this psalm a step further. 
showing us exactly how far God is willing to lower himself to be able to hear the praises of his people. You see, as the psalm says, God gave humanity dominion and rulership over the creation, crowned him with glory and honour and gave him a special position to rule over the world. But we rejected that position. We rejected God and started worshipping ourselves and the creation instead of the Creator. And that sin has stopped us from being able to praise God. And so God stepped into the world. He gave up everything that was his right, everything that he was owed, so that he could come and find us and we could praise him again. Then he took a step lower and he died to take the punishment that we deserved so that we might join him forever in singing his praises in the new earth. You see, just as God is willing to accept the worship of those who cannot give him what he is owed, he is willing to lower himself as far as necessary in order to bring his children back to him. This is how Paul puts it from our readings earlier in Philippians. Chapter 2, verses 5 to 7 say, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself. God the Son did not have to come as a person. He did not have to give up his throne to live with us. He didn't have to die, but he wanted to do so so that we could join with him and give God his praise. We are now able to meet with God, to give him everything that he is owed. And he doesn't just accept what we have to say. He remembers who we are and counts the number of hairs on our heads so that he can know who his children are, where they are, and everything about us. And yes, God does deserve all the orchestras and choirs in the world singing his praises, but he is also content to hear the wordless praise of children and infants, a sincere heart and a true faith is far more valuable to God than all the choirs of the world. And as we reflect on this, we realise that church kind of doesn't feel like church at the moment. We're stuck in our living rooms. Singing by yourself with your family doesn't feel the same as singing with others. Our prayers are a little bit mumbled because we're a little bit embarrassed to say them out loud. And let's be honest, our living rooms just don't have the same atmosphere and gravitas as a church building. But the God who is willing to accept the praise of infants and children is more than willing to accept whatever we can offer during these times. He knows our circumstances. He knows that the reason we are not meeting together is to show love to our neighbours and ensure they don't get sick. He sees our struggles to get the internet working. He hears our out-of-tune singing and he says, there is my church. And no, it's not ideal. Yes, we should try and get back to meeting normally in the same building as soon as we can. But that doesn't mean that what we're doing right now isn't church. God still hears us as we are in our home and is grateful to hear our out-of-tune singing and our mumbled prayers amidst the noise of toddlers playing with trucks. God knows why we can't meet, and he is happy to accept whatever praise we are able to offer him in our living rooms over live stream. You see, when God's enemies come to him and say, your church isn't meeting, it must be dead, 
God points to the living rooms and says, there's my church. When the enemy come and say, your people are scattered, they don't know who you are. God points to our living room and our songs and says, there are my children. I am listening to them. God was willing to give up everything so that we could join with him and live for him forever when Jesus returns. He is willing to accept the wordless praise of nursing infants. That means he is more than willing to accept whatever we can offer to him while we are stuck in our living rooms at home. Online church may not be ideal. It doesn't have the same feeling as actually being in the church building. But that doesn't mean that God is ignoring us. He hears us and he longs for us to be together. God, he is the creator of the universe and he has created an amazing universe. And if this world and beyond is so amazing, how much more amazing must be the God who created it? But that amazing God was willing to empty himself so that we might be given glory and honour. When Jesus was raised to life again, God put him on the throne. He was the true and perfect Adam who did what humanity was always supposed to do. And now he continues to do humanity's job, ruling the world under God. And now, because of his death and resurrection, we can come to God as his children. The creator of the universe knows who we are, remembers our names, and is happy to listen to everything that we are willing to say. God is owed all the choirs of the world, all the orchestras that we can muster singing his praise. But until he comes again and we are able to offer that, he's happy to accept what little we can offer. He hears our mumbled prayers. He is pleased with our praise. He is willing to accept whatever we can offer from our homes. What is man that you are mindful of him? We are his children. And he loves to hear us sing, no matter how out of tune we happen to be. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. And we thank you that you show us that you are willing to grant us glory and honor that we do not deserve. And we pray that you will inspire us to continue singing your praises even though it is not perfect. And we thank you that no matter what we do, that you hear us and are happy to hear us sing. Amen.